Now, I want to talk to you today about putting on the new person that you are. Thank you for that holy silence. You feel that? Hear that holy silence? Glory to God. Putting on the new person that you are, that you really are. Now, a friend of mine, uh, Dr. Dean Radke, is a consultant for churches and businesses, uh, top-level executive. He was talking, he taught us as we were training, he, he was, how he would talk to people about their, the program or the plan that they had for developing leaders in their church. And he was talking with one pastor and said, and ask him, you know, what's your plan for developing leaders? And the guy says, well, we teach them the 10, the 10 keys of leadership. And which, to which Dr. Radke, we reply, well, which 10? You know, because there's a lot of keys to leadership. And to which the pastor replied, well, you know, be sharp, look sharp, act sharp, sharpen up, and six other sharp things. <laughs> now, I want us to understand as I'm talking to you, I'm not talking about sharpening up. Okay, I'm not talking about something you just give it the old college try, give it your best effort to, to, to sharpen up. I think about what the evangelist Billy Graham, now some of you may be younger, I ran into some, some younger people who don't even know who Billy Graham was. Uh, he was a great evangelist, preached about Jesus all over the world, brought hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, to life in Christ. Yeah. Awesome, awesome man of God. But I remember as he was approached uh, about uh, hiring an image consultant for their ministry and doing some marketing. And his response to that, oh, and there's nothing wrong with that stuff, but his response was that he was not interested in presenting something that wasn't real. Amen. His focus and our focus as believers, as we talk about putting on the new person that you are, is about simply being who you genuinely are and letting that show out. Shining that out. You know, uh, if you want to be a leader... So you want to be an influencer, you want to be uh, an internet influencer, you want to be famous, then as one person said, don't be concerned about being unique. Just be authentic. Amen. That's huge in life as a believer and in what we're talking about today. We're talk not talking about trying to be somebody you're not. We're talking about being genuine. In Philemon the book of Philemon, we've referred to this the last couple of weeks, verse 6. Philemon was a believer. He was, he was experienced with the things of God. He's tasted and seen that the Lord is good. He's been walking with the Lord. He has a good testimony of God's grace in his life. But now by his friend, the Apostle Paul, he's being called up to a new level. He's being called out by, by Paul sending uh, Philemon's escaped slave who has become a believer a brother in Christ, now Paul is sending him back to Philemon and, and asking Philemon to receive him as a brother. And so he's being called out. He's, he has this opportunity to have a witness in the world, to let his light shine even brighter. Can it get an amen? He's got this choice he needs to make, but here's how it's going to happen in Philemon 6. This is how the Living Bible uh, paraphrase. Paul says to him, and I pray that as you share your faith with others, it will grip their lives too, as they see the wealth of good things in you that come from Christ Jesus. Now, that's how this whole thing works. We walk with Christ in an authentic way. We, we be ourselves in the Lord. And the light that's in us, that comes into us, shines out. And, the, and then people experience it. That through this process of acknowledging, of seeing it and knowing it ourselves, and experiencing it, that whole thing happens, that whole experience happens as we see it and we acknowledge it, and we, we, then we can experience it. And we'll talk more about that in days to come. And as you acknowledge it and walk in it, then others get to taste it. You start to bear fruit. You may not realize it, but you become more loving. You become more joyful. Amen. Thank you for not looking at your spouse and elbowing them. You become more joyful. You become more gentle. God removes the harshness and abrasiveness 
out of your life. You become more patient. You become more balanced in life, more temperate in everything. Less, less tendencies to go overboard and stuff. You become more balanced. All these wonderful things happen as the life that's in you because of your union with Christ. In other words, with, because you have accepted Jesus as Lord and he's changing you from the inside out, you begin to experience these things. They begin to show, and others begin to pick that fruit off of your life. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. And, I, you know, we grow tomatoes. People were teasing us the other day about being the experts or whatever about tomatoes. We usually only have two plants, but we do enjoy raising tomatoes, and we enjoy eating tomatoes. Can I get an amen? amen. You know, about, I'd start naming ways, but how can I count the ways? But anyway, I've never heard my tomato plant groaning. I've never walked out there and heard it, heard my, walked around the corner of her and hearing, like it's trying to birth a tomato or something. No, it just stays hooked up to the nutrients and lives in the sunshine and receives, and receives the, the wonderful rain and grows up. And the God's DNA that he's put in, and all of a sudden, boop, little green tomatoes come out, and then with enough sunshine, and you know how it works. And then comes the bacon, and the toast, and the mayonnaise, and whoo, all the good stuff. It's got to be from God, because every good and perfect thing comes down from above, the scripture said. So can you say it with me? Tomatoes are from God. So, but the point is, the point is, it just the natural way of, of things happening. And I'm talking to you about putting on the new person that you are. Not some phoniness, not some effort that you're doing, not trying to conform to somebody's picture or your picture even of what you think you ought to be or how you think you ought to look. But learning about who God's really made you, who you really are, and then putting that on the outside. Now, skinny jeans used to be in style. My physique does not really work well with skinny jeans. So I'm kind of glad boot cuts are coming back. You know, there's just some things you just ought not ever see. I mean, you see it, you know, you, know, you can't ever get that picture out of your mind again. And some people, but the point is, fashions change, right? Now, being a graduate of the 70s, you know, being married to the girl with the biggest bells in school. I'm glad to see him come back around. But you know, we don't wear those things because somebody else says to wear them. You know, otherwise you just look like an imitation. You're trying too hard. Anybody know what I mean? You look at some, man, they're trying too hard. Well, unfortunately, that's how some believers look. They're just trying too hard. And we just want to talk about putting on the new person that you are. In Philippians, because for Philemon, it was right there. That was his hour. But this is our hour. And this is what God is doing in the world today. He's drawing people closer to himself in a very genuine and authentic way. Just drawing closer to him. Getting the main things, the main things once again. Being genuine, being real in your life with God. And because you are, and through your authenticity, you're able, you pass your faith, you pass the faith onto the next generation. Because they can smell fake a mile away. And so, and, and a lot of people, they're, they're not trying to be fake. But we just all need to recognize how the process works so we can lay aside that play acting and just live real. Why don't you all take a deep breath and relax a little bit and realize that you're with Christ and we're going to talk about that. This is our hour. Can you say it this way? This is our hour. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 18. Again, I'm reading out of the Living Bible. He says, let me... Ephesians 4, 18, let me say this then, speaking for the Lord, live no longer, and he's writing to believers. How many believers we got in the room today? Can I see your hand? 
All right, if you, thank you for being here. Praise the Lord. If you have not yet believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, this is your day. Okay, it's not hard, and it's not mental. It comes from your heart. With the heart, a person believes. And so you can trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not your own understanding. You know, understanding will come along the way. There's some things that you're never going to understand till after you accept Jesus. Simply because his life needs to come into you and make you able to understand. Jesus himself said to his disciples before his crucifixion, there's a lot of things I have to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. And it's not like the guy in the movie, you can't handle the truth. No, it's the fact you don't, you're not equipped. You don't have the equipment. You don't have God's life on the inside of you that enables you to see these things. But once you accept Christ, you'll be able to see them. And when you can see them, you can be them. Can I get an amen? Ephesians 4, 18. Let me say this then, speaking for the Lord, live no longer. And again, he's talking to believers. Can you, as a believer, can you say this is talking to me? Say it with me. This is speaking to me. Live no longer as the unsaved do, for they are blinded and confused. Their closed hearts are full of darkness. They are far away from the life of God because they have shut their minds against Him. And they cannot understand His ways. They don't care anymore about right and wrong and have given themselves over to impure ways. They stop at nothing, being driven by their evil minds and reckless lusts. Now again, lust there is not just sexual sins, but it's, it's lust is that desire that desire, that passionate desire to have something that is contrary to God and His best for people. It, it's the lust of the flesh. It shows up as lust for things. It's putting yourself first. It's, it's living for self. And that's the way that people are out there in the world. Can you say, but not me? Not you. Amen. Look at your neighbor and tell them, but not you. Verse 20, but that isn't the way Christ taught you. If you have really heard his voice and learned from him the truths concerning himself, then throw off your old evil nature, the old you that was a partner in your evil ways, rotten through and through, full of, of lust and sham. Now your attitudes and thoughts must, now your attitudes and thoughts must be all, all be constantly changing Boy, I botched that reading. Now your attitudes and thoughts must all be constantly changing for the better. How many of us as a believer can acknowledge since the moment you accepted Christ, your attitudes and your thoughts are constantly changing? Okay, it's a journey. It's a progress. So don't ever feel like, well, because I'm not at the pinnacle, I'm not at the end of the journey, I'm just not. I mean, None of us parents like to hear the kids from the back seat say, are we there yet? But the reality is you're not there yet. But you are on the way. Amen? Now, yes, you must be a new and different person, holy and good. Clothe yourself with this new nature. Now, notice who's going to be doing the clothing? It's you. It's me. We clothe ourselves. It's not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer we used to sing. You know, it's not since not the pastor. Like one person came up to a pastor and said, Pastor, fix my life. And this pastor looked at him and said, I can't fix your life. Only you can fix your life. Yeah. You know, each of us have to accept our own responsibilities. Isn't that right? Yeah, right. Clothe yourself with what? With the new nature. With the new nature. In the New King James Version, verses 22 to 24 read that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man, which was created according to God. You ready to shout? In true righteousness and holiness. You were recreated, born anew. You're something different, someone different. Hear this. You have been recreated 
holy, and righteous. And I know sometimes we don't feel like that. And some of you may be, well, that that pastor doesn't know me very well. Well, no, I would venture to say if you're a believer and you're having a fit with this, you just don't know you very well. You don't know who you really are yet. You know, the Bible, these things about who you are now, this is like a family album, a family portrait. You need to look in here and find yourself. And, and, and we put an end then to the thoughts of the evil one who are lying to you and perpetuating this identity that you have, this inner image that you have, your, uh, this self-talk, this negative self-talk about yourself all the time. Because God has done a work, on, a miracle work on the inside of you. He's made you a different person. Now what we're talking about today is putting on the outside that new person you become on the inside. Amen. See, some behaviors don't even fit you anymore. You know, some language doesn't even fit you anymore. Some friends, some associations, they don't even fit you anymore. And now it's time for us as a believer, if you really want to change your life, do what the Bible says and put on the new person you really are. Matter of fact, one translation says it exactly that way about this, about uh, putting on the new man. Another translation says, put on the new person that you are. Amen. That's why I call this talk this. Put on the new person that you are. This echoes what the Lord told me one day. I was on my knees praying. You know, we would say at the altar. You know, that means it could be the steps, could be right here, could be right where, where you are, your heart is poured out to God. You, you're bringing the sacrifice of your life to Him. And right at that moment, I was, you know, talking with the Lord and expressing my heart of how I wanted to serve Him. I wanted to, I wanted to be doing the right thing the right way. And that's what he ministered to my heart. Just be the person that you be, be the person you became when you received Jesus, the moment you accepted Jesus as Lord. See, I became a new person inside. And you did too. And now the challenge is not to go out there and try to find something else, but simply put on the outside who you become on the inside. And of course, you need to come to the Word of God and find out who that is. You don't let it change your thinking. And then you can change your behaviors in your talk. Can I get an amen? amen? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, verse in the New King James Version says, For we are, and, and we're going to look at quite a few verses here, so let's move quickly today. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good works which God prepared beforehand, that we should walk in them. Look how this reads in the Amplified Classic Version. For we, can you say this means me? Means me. Say it with me again. This means me. means me. See, in all these things, the Word of God begins to work in our souls, in our hearts, the control center of our life, and our souls, our emotions, our thinking, our reasoning, where we see ourselves. Begins to drag down wrong thinking and wrong self-talk about ourselves. And change the narrative on the inside of our heart. And when that nar- as that narrative changes, your life changes. Glory to God. How many want to walk with Jesus? Well, this is how it's done. Amplified says, For we are God's own handiwork, His workmanship, recreated in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand, for us, taking paths which he prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, living the good life which he prearranged and made ready for us to live. Amen. Say it with me. I'm God's handiwork. God's handiwork. Now, I think that it would be wise to stop cursing God's handiwork. Thank you for those comments and that holy silence. Like a friend of mine used to say, say amen or oh me because it's all true anyway. Another friend said, uh, that's an owie. Well, listen. Stop speaking evil of what God calls good. 
Because those words, you're cursing your own life. You're disagreeing with God. You're denying what he says. So what if it doesn't feel true? It is true. And if you'll let the truth come and have your heart, it'll change your life. Amen? Amen. See, Titus chapter 2, verse 14 says, Jesus gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, and to make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. Wow. Zealous for good things. Zealots for doing good stuff. Eager to do good stuff. Pursuers of good works. God made a difference on the inside of us. You know, when I say, can I get an amen? I'm not looking for props for me. I'm looking to, to, for a way for, well, let's just try it. Can I get an amen? amen? What's that do? That gets us in agreement with what the word of God says. It opens our hearts and lets this slip down just a little bit deeper on the inside of us as we're acknowledging the good things that God has done in you through Christ Jesus. Can I get an amen? amen. See, Romans 6, 2 says that you are dead to sin through your union with Christ. Dead to it. Now, I may believe it would be inappropriate for someone laying in a casket. When somebody walks up, the body's laying in the casket, it'd be totally inappropriate if someone walked up and said something insulting to the person. But how many believe it would be also very unusual for the person, the body laying there in the coffin, upon hearing that insult, haul off and give the, the person that has spoken an uppercut right out of the casket, just bam! Wouldn't work, would it? How many say not going to happen? Why? Because that person in the casket is dead to that. Through Christ, you're dead to sin. Well, I don't know, Pastor. I sure raises a response out of me. Well, it's because you don't know the truth. The truth hasn't yet. Come on, let the, let the truth grab your heart. And acknowledge it. I'm, say it with me. I'm dead to sin. Verse 7, same chapter, Romans 6, says you've been freed from sin. Freed from it. Romans 8, verse 3, said that through what God did, he, can, he, he wrapped sin in the flesh, he boxed it in, and he deprived it of power over everyone who accepts the sacrifice of Christ. I'm going to encourage you to believe that today. And to recognize, to recognize that a lot of times those things come up to you and this, I'm going to get you. And you let it get you. We let it get us. Because we don't know it's powerless. And so we give it power in our life simply by believing it. A lot of it's no more than a totally paralyzed person sitting in a wheelchair, quadriplegic, saying, I'm going to get you. I'm, no, they're not getting it. And then please take this the right way. I'm not belittling any person. I'm just trying to tell you that sin has no power over you. It boasts itself. It presents itself as though it does. But the reality is you've been delivered. Amen. You've been delivered from its power. I hope you're beginning to get an image, a different image on the inside of you and getting an image on the inside of you of the victory place that you're in because you've accepted Jesus. Amen. Let's, let's go on. You're re recreated in union with Christ. Listen, what God, what God wanted for you, he did in Christ. He did through Christ. What God wanted in you, he put in Christ. Now you've been joined with him. You've been brought into union with him. See, what happened? What happened for you? What happened to you in Christ? In his death and burial and resurrection and your reception of him is more powerful than anything else in your life that has happened to you. 
What God did for you in Christ breaks, breaks the power of those things and empowers you to live a different life. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 17 says this, that you're, if any person's in Christ, in union with Christ, and in Christ, if, when you receive Jesus, God joined you with Jesus. Spiritually, you became one with him. And if you're in Christ, you're a new creature. New in the sense of something never heard of before. Something that never existed before. A new breed. A new humanity. Say it with me. I'm a new creature. Goes on to say, old things have passed away. So crucial you understand that, that you see that. Isaiah 43, 25, God said. Can you all say God said? God said, I, even I am he that blotteth out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. This is what God said. I, even I, am he who blotteth out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Glory to God. Almighty God said, I'm not going to recall them. I'm not going to remember them. I blot them out. I mean, it's hard enough to get mustard off a shirt. You know what I mean? Just just throw the tie away because you're not going to get that out. Well, your sins in your life and before God and the condemnation in your heart that comes when you screw up. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Or that big mistake you made or that lousy decision that you made way back there or maybe yesterday or this morning sticks in our souls strong, more strongly than the mustard in the tie or the shirt. And we let it control us. It's like the stain in the shirt. Says, you're never going to amount to nothing. You're never going to get that job. See, you screwed up again. See, you never, you're a sloppy eater and a lousy liver. You're a loser. And that condemnation in our soul from how we've messed up or the decisions that we make, because let's admit it, not everything is a mistake. Some of us are deliberate choice. Just like Adam in the garden, Eve was deceived, but Adam knew full well what he was doing. And we can't say like Adam did to the woman, who you gave me, God. We can't shuck and jive and blame somebody else. Amen? This is better preaching. I'm doing better preaching than you're doing shouting. But God says, I wiped it out. I cleansed it for my own sake. Why? He wants you. He wants you in his family. He wants to love you. He wants you walking free. Glory be to God forevermore. Can you say amen? You're a new creature. It's so important you see this. You're a brand new creature. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. All things have become new. See, see what's that? Best news ever. Best news ever. I got a good report from the front row. Amen. <laughs> See, we have to realize that the old identity of yourself and the, li- the limitations you've established for yourself are no longer valid. Amen. They no longer reign. I found this, this came across this quote, and it's so good. It says, when Jesus came to preach the gospel to the poor, he didn't just pass out a bunch of fish sandwiches. He taught them the ways and thoughts of God. He taught them that they didn't have to be poor or sick or defeated anymore. Jesus is still changing people's identities. Horizons, horizons. You know, each one of us, uh, like we read in Ephesians 2, these works that he's prepared for us before the foundation of the world, that we should do them. This good life, he's prearranged and made ready for us to live, that we should walk it out. God's ahead of you. He God say it with me. God's got me. Come on, you knew better than that. God's got me. 
Yeah, and he's had you for a long time, and now he's brought you to himself, and he's got your life laid out before you. He's got good things, good things, not burdensome things, not lousy things, Amen. good things. Things to bless your heart, things that will bless others' hearts. You're, you're a good thing for this world. Now, I want us to read very quickly some things in Ephesians chapter 1 and 2. We're going to read an extended part, and then I want to give you some cues to, to put on that new person. Let's quickly go to Ephesians chapter 1, starting with verse 3. Again, read now the Living Bible. How we praise God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every blessing in heaven because we belong to Christ. Now, as I read through this, as we read through this, it'd be good for you to mark in your Bible or make, put in your notes all these wonderful things that are yours in Christ. All these wonderful things that have happened in your life, because these are big changes. Big changes. Big things that belong to you. Verse 4, long ago, even before he made the world, God chose us. There's one to be his very own through what Christ would do for us. God chose you before you were ever here to screw it up. God chose you to be his own. Amen. Welcome to the family. He, then did, he decided then to make us holy in his eyes without a single fault. We who stand before him covered with his love. You're holy in his sight. You're covered with his love. His unchanging plan has always been to adopt us into his own family by sending Jesus Christ to die for us. You've been adopted. Say it with me. I've been adopted. And he did this because he wanted to. Oh, glory to God. Not because he had to. Please stop feeling. Please let this word deal with that. Please stop feeling like somehow out of all the people in the world who God wanted, somehow somebody left the door open and you snuck in and God doesn't know you're really there. Like if God really knew you were there, he'd kick you out right now. And so you're kind of hiding back in the corner. No, dear friend, Almighty God knows everything, everywhere. He sees you, knows you, and he's so excited that you're in his family. He planned it long ago, and he's adopted you. Shout it out, I'm wanted. Shout it out, I belong. These are the sorts of things that Philemon was walking in, and, and Paul was saying, as you live these things out, and this light shows out of you, Man, people will be drawn and they'll ask. And you can invite them into the family and they can begin to taste and see and experience it too. Can I get an amen? amen? Verse 6, Now all praise to God for His wonderful kindness to us and His favor that He has poured out upon us. Say, I've got favor. Because we belong to His dearly loved Son. Say, I belong to Jesus. So overflowing is his kindness toward us that he took away all our sins through the blood of his son. Say it, my sins are gone. Sins are gone. By whom we're saved. Say it, I've been saved by Jesus. And he has showered down upon us the richness of his grace. Say it, I've been showered with grace. For how well he understands us and knows what's best for at all times. Say it, God understands me. Say it, God knows what's best for me at all times. God has told us his secret reason for sending Christ, a plan he decided on in mercy long ago. And this was his purpose. Say it, be God's let me in on the secret. Ooh, that feels good, doesn't it? And this was his purpose that when the time is right, he will gather all together, all things, wherever we are, wherever they are, in heaven or on earth, to be with him in Christ forever. Moreover, because of what Christ has done, we become gifts to God that he delights in. We've received an inheritance and we're gifts to God that he delights in for as part of God's sovereign plan. We were chosen from the beginning to be his. And all things happen just as he decided long ago. God's purpose in this was that we should praise God and give glory to him for doing these mighty things for us who were the first to trust in Christ and because of what Christ did, all you others too. Listen, this is not just for Pastor Lauren and Pastor Joy. This is not just for a few exceptional ones. I want you to know that all of you, all of you in the room, all of us with, with you online, with us online, this is for you too. 
All you others, too, who heard the good news about how to be saved and trusted Christ were marked as belonging to Christ by the Holy Spirit, who long ago had been promised to all Christians his presence within us is God's guarantee that he really will give us all that he promised. More powerful than earnest money when you're buying a house or down payment is the fact that God's put his spirit on the inside of you as his guarantee, his down payment, his seal is upon you. All that he's spoken of you is going to come. And he's faithful. Can I get an amen? This is just one reason for us to praise our glorious God. Then he goes on to talk about the prayer. I want to encourage you to read the rest of chapter 1. Read the rest of chapter 1 because it's Paul's prayer. And I want to encourage you to pray it for yourself. Take it and stick your name in there. That God would give you wisdom and revelation in knowing him better. Because the Holy Spirit is who he sent to unveil these things. Someone said that these things that the Apostle Paul has written and the Holy Spirit has brought forth through the Apostles and the Bible. These are the words that Jesus took to the grave unuttered. These are the things that are many things that we could not bear. But now he's revealing the secret plan of God to us. Can I get an amen? I hope your hearts are being blessed today. Amen. Chapter 2, and once you were under God's curse, doomed forever for your sins, you went along with the crowd and you were just like all the others, full of sin, obeying Satan, the mighty prince of the power of the air, who is at work right now in the hearts of those who are against the Lord. All of us used to be just as they are, our lives expressing the evil within us, doing every wicked thing that our passion or our evil thoughts might lead us into. We started out bad, being born with evil natures and we're under God's anger just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy. He loved us so much that even though we were spiritually dead and doomed by our sins, He gave us life. He gave us back our lives again when He raised Christ from the dead. Only by His undeserved favor have we ever been saved. So He gave us His life and lifted us up from the grave into glory along with Christ, where we sit with Him in the heavenly realms. All because of what Christ Jesus did. And now God can always point to us as examples of how very, very rich in His kindness is, as shown in all He's done for us through Jesus Christ. Because of His kindness, you've been saved through trusting Christ. And even trusting is not of yourselves. It, too, is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good we've done, so none of us can take credit for it. It is God Himself who's made us what we are and given us new lives from Christ Jesus. And long ages ago, he planned that we should spend these lives in helping others. Can I get an amen? amen. Now I'm going to take five minutes and talk to you about cues. Because there are some things in our life that trigger these habits that we walk in, these old things that cling to us. And there's some simple things that we can do to replace these old habits, these negative habits, with some new ones. You're not just going to stop them. You need to replace them. Can they get an amen? amen? Now, here's five things that trigger. And let me, let me just read you a verse. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 13 to 15. Hold on to instruction. Do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the way of evildoers. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn from it and go on your way. That sounds a lot, a lot like put on the new person that you are. But there are some triggers, some cues, some reminders, some things that work in us. For instance, here's five of them. First one is time. Time, let me just give them to you quick. Time, location, a preceding event, an emotional state, and other people. We're going to unpack this just for a moment. Time. Time, for instance, you wake up in the morning and, and you, you have a morning routine. You get up, maybe go to the bathroom first. Maybe the first thing you do is go out to the kitchen and make, put the coffee on. You have a habit. Can we understand what I'm talking about? It's because of that time. And, or you're at work and, oh, what time is it? It's snack time. I've been working all day. It's time to go grab something to eat. Or for some of us, it's smoke time. It's time, to, it's time that we, we go out and, you know, or maybe it's, 
It, okay, this is the time. What do we do? What do I do this time? Well, now I wander out to the kitchen. I wander out to the water cool. I wander out to the get started center, and I spend about five or ten minutes catching up on the latest things that's going on. I walk around the building and I talk to Joe and I talk to Mary and I talk to Susie and you know get my relational fix and, and then I come back and I'm good for the rest of the morning. I do that every morning halfway through. Maybe that's what you're saying. That's what time it is, and that time triggers certain behaviors in you. So what do you do? I want you to, here's one thing that you can do, set a new response for that cue. When it becomes time, replace that with with a new habit. You know, do something, you know, replace smoke time, for instance, with confession time. You know, instead of, this is the time I'm going to get up and go have a cigarette, you know, or vape or something like that. No, this is the time now. At this time of day, I'm going to get out and I'm going to go acknowledge. I'm going to say to God, the devil, the angels, anybody that happens to be overhearing, I'm going to say I'm a new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. I have the greater one living on the inside of me. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And you take that time that you had something negative happening and you replace what you did. And before long, you'll find that that time when it comes triggers a good behavior in you instead of a bad behavior in you. Here's another one, location. Location. I couldn't tell you how many times over the years I've come home from work, not even thinking about food, but the moment I walked in, I was hungry. Anybody remember coming home from school, the first thing you did, what's the first thing you do when you come home from school? Well, you grab something to eat. You know, or I'm talking about locations, just because you're right there. Or there's a particular Mexican restaurant in town that I noticed that location triggers me. I walk in, and, and when they ask me what I want to drink, I want a Diet Coke. Now, I don't drink Diet Coke any other time in my life, hardly. I mean, for years, I, I've avoided caffeine. And then one day I was in there and they asked, what do you want to drink? Oh, you know, I want a Diet Coke. For some reason, Diet Coke just goes with their chips and salsa. I don't know what it is, but it's just the location. Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying? So what do you do? Anybody know what I'm talking about? You know, it's that location that triggers some bad behavior on the inside. So what are you going to do? Well, Jesus talked about this in Matthew 6, 6, where he talked about prayer life. He said, when you go into your room, when you pray, go into your room and close the door behind you. In other words, have a location, have a location that when you go to that location, it just triggers prayer. Or if you have a certain location that triggers a poor behavior, well, maybe you want to avoid the location, or even better, just take that location, if it's one you shouldn't, you know, if you have to be there, put some good behavior with it instead of some bad behavior. And if you'll do that, that location will begin to trigger godliness things in you instead of evil things. Can you get an amen? This making sense? A preceding event is the third one. How many of you have ever experienced this? On my phone, I get a ding when a message comes in. And I found that when I look at that message, next thing I find myself doing is scrolling Facebook. What is this? It's a cue. It's just a cue. Identify those things and change them. Okay, what are we talking about? You know, instead of, instead of for instance, when you make coffee, you're proceeding event, I'm going to make coffee, and then I'm going to scroll through Facebook, or I'm going to Instagram, or something like that. Instead of that, uh, when you go to make coffee, let it become a word time. You know, when I make coffee, when I have my coffee in the morning, I spend time with the Lord. See, you have replaced that old habit with a new one. Or your emotional state. Our emotions trigger us. They trigger bad habits. You know, I think of halt. Hungry, angry, lonely, and tired. When I'm hungry, when I'm angry, when I'm lonely, when I'm tired, I'm vulnerable. I'm vulnerable. I know I'll not stay up. I've just watched two episodes of that thing, and now I'm finding myself turning on the next one. I need to go to bed. 
Why am, I, why am I staying up? Well, I just had a great victory at work, had a hard, hard day at work, or I had a good appointment, and I, I had a good week at work, I had, I had a good appointment, or I really preached well, so what am I going to do? Man, I'm feeling good about myself. Man, what am I going to do? I'm going to go to Texas Roadhouse for lunch, and I know they send six of those wonderful wheat rolls with every meal, and I'm going to have two, and then I'm going to have two more, and then because you don't want to throw them away, they get hard after a day or so, I'm going to eat the other two. Why? Because I did good, man. Or I really bombed that message. What am I going to do? I'm going to go get some Texas Roadhouse meal, and I know they send six of those little rolls with it, and I'm going to eat two. Oh, sweet, oh, wheat roll, comfort me. You know, I'm coming to the altar of wheat roll and with the, with the balm of cinnamon butter, or whatever it is, not butter, but whatever it is. Amen? Our emotional state. Our emotional state triggers us. Well, here's something that we can do. You know, when you, when you feel yourself having tight muscles or shallow breathing, I mean, full transparency, my wife's had to help me with this. You know, I've got some tells. She asks me every now and then, how are you doing? Are you nervous? I said, why? Well, you can just tell. Just little mannerism or something. But when your body's talking to you, your muscles are tight, you're breathing shallow. Here's a couple things you can do. Let that trigger you to take some deep breaths. Why don't we just practice right now? God's gift is the air for our lungs, right? Everybody take a deep breath right now. Okay, don't just die right there. Okay, let it out. <laughs> Try it again. Let, take another. Come on, deep breath. We're going to calm down. Or you feel yourself instead of Instead of letting that tightness trigger you with anxiety, what do we go? How about taking a praise cure? How about let it trigger thankfulness, gratefulness? Philippians, Philippians 4 6 says, Don't worry about anything. Tell God your needs. Thank Him for His answers. Man, let's, how about letting that, that tightness trigger gratefulness and gratitude? Let's have the worship team coming up. And here's another one. Here's the last one. Other people. Other people can trigger these negative things. The New England Journal of Medicine found that if your friend becomes obese, then your risk of obesity increases by 57%, even if your friend lives 100 miles away. Now, I'm glad the devil's going to get thrown into the pit forever. For doing that to us. Now maybe you're one of these people that can eat everything you want and, and never put on a pound. I'll forgive you for that. <laughs> you know, or I'll ask you to lay your hands on me and give me a little bit of that. I mean, you know, I went to the doctor one time and he says, how's your weight doing? I told him, he says, you're eating, are you eating stress? Yeah. You get around heavy people, you're going to get heavy. I'm talking about putting on the person that you really are. James Roan said this, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Who you hang with can trigger bad behavior. So what do you do? Well, you remember Indiana Jones? The guy in Indiana Jones said it this way, choose wisely, my son. What do you do? You choose a new set of companions, and you choose them wisely. Because the five that you're around the most, you're going to become the average of those. So choose wisely, my son. Choose wisely, my daughter. Choose your friends. Choose your friends so you can easily, more easily put on the new person that you want to be and that you've become. I want to just take a moment right now. Some of you, as I've been talking today, you know some decisions that you need to make. You know, maybe not all of you, but some of you. It's very clear that I need to take this step. As the music's playing, as we're praying right now, I want to encourage you to just make that decision right here, right now. 
you're going to respond differently to that cue. You're going to take different action. You're going to spend that time with the Lord that you need, with His Word, letting letting Him build a new picture in your mind of who you are. Maybe your mom, your dad, others always told you you were worthless, you'd never amount to nothing. Jesus gave His life, showing you His love, proving to you how valuable you are to God and how valuable you are to us and who you, how valuable you should be to yourself. Let God's love wash all of you. So I'm speaking. Go ahead and make that decision right now. Father, thank you for speaking to our hearts today. Thank you for showing us, Father. I thank you for unveiling to us these thoughts of yours, these words of yours. As Brittany said earlier, they don't return void. They accomplish what you sent them to do. They drag down strongholds. They open up new horizons. They bring your love more deeply into heart, the reality of our acceptance, Lord. Thank you for your pardon and your purchase of us. Thank you, Lord.